Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mario Hewart, and I am a principal premier field engineer here at Microsoft. Um, before we get started here, uh, just want to give a big shout out to the WSLConf organizers. Um, they went from a live conference to a virtual conference in, in essentially zero time, so not an easy feat to, to do, and uh, my hat's off to them. So what we're going to be talking about today is um, this project we call SysInternals for Linux. And uh, let's start a little bit about the motivation behind this. Uh, SysInternals is a tool suite uh, that is used by developers, sysadmins alike, that exists on Windows today. And it consists of a, a large plethora of, of tools. Um, here are some of the examples that, that exist today. We've got Process Explorer, which gives you an in-depth view of all the processes running on the system. Uh, process Monitor is a way to find out what all those processes are doing, um, all the way down to the Win32 API calls. Uh, another example is ProcDump. And ProcDump is a way to generate memory dumps from processes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And there are many, many more tools in this particular tool suite. So when we thought about different ways um, that we could help, in terms of diagnostics tooling for Linux, we took a look at SysInternals for Windows, and we wanted to see if there was any merit in uh, in moving some of those tools over to the Linux ecosystem. And as part of that, we we set out sort of these guiding principles that we use um, when we sort of look at the available ecosystem and make a decision on whether tools uh, should be moved or not. And the first one that we really stick to here is that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If it already exists on Linux, it makes zero sense for us to go and uh, reinvent the wheel there. Um, a great example of that is Process Explorer. That exists on Windows. Um, like I said, it's it's a tool that lists all the processes on running on the system, and uh, you can deep dive into each one to get a lot more information about it. Well, that already exists on Linux, right? We have Top, we have HTOP, and, and some other ones as well. And so there was not really a good candidate for us to, uh, to work on. Now, the other guiding principle is that these tools must be production ready, right? There are, there are tools that are intended to be used when things go wrong in production, right? And as such, we want them to be small. We want them to be targeted, meaning that they do one thing and do one thing really, really well. And they have to be low overhead, right? When you're investigating an issue in production, the system is not behaving as optimally as it possibly can, and you don't want the diagnostics tools themselves to add additional overhead or burden on the system. The third sort of guiding principle that we had is that we wanted to be quote unquote born in Linux. We want we want the tools to feel comfortable and feel familiar for Linux developers, right? So we don't want to come in and, and take necessarily the approach that we had in Windows and just move it flat over to Linux, but we wanted to make it seem like it's it's a, it's a tool that's been born in Linux. And lastly, we uh, we want the tools to be open source so that everyone in the community can contribute to it. And, uh, uh, and that's what we're sort of striving for in terms of guiding principles. So with all that being said, let's dive in and take a look at what tooling or tools out of that tool suite that we have decided to work on and move. And the first one being ProcDump for Linux. Now, ProcDump is simply a way to generate core dumps from running processes on Linux. It's nothing new here, right? We, we have that capability today. You can use the debuggers, GDB, or you can use G-Core, um, and probably a plethora of other tools. Now, the real power of, of ProcDump for Linux really stems from its monitoring capabilities, right? Well, we uh, investigate application issues in production, oftentimes they're intermittent and we don't quite know when they're going to happen. And so having on-demand uh, core dump generation tools like G-Core isn't really sufficient because there isn't enough time to actually get in there and run G-Core if you have a very short-lived um, outage. Um, so the power of ProcDump for Linux comes from monitoring. And the way that that works is that you run ProcDump and you have the capability of specifying triggers. Um, an example of a trigger is uh, generate me a core dump when CPU goes above X% for example, 
or generate me a core dump when memory exceeds some threshold like 500 or 600 megs, right? All those things are configurable by whoever is running uh, proc dump. The other thing about proc dump is that when possible, we integrate with other runtimes. And by that, I mean, if you were to run gcore today um, on a .NET process that's running in .NET core, you're gonna end up with a very, very large dump file. Um, on my particular machine, I got 64 gigs of RAM, um, a basic hello world web API in ASP.NET core ended up being about nine to 10 gigs. And that's just the virtue or by virtue of the runtime uh, allocating and reserving a lot of memory and G-Core indiscriminately dumping everything um, out to the core. If you end up with a nine or 10 gig dump file, very uh, difficult um, or painful, I should say, to manage that file. Because oftentimes what we end up doing is we take the dump file from um, the production machine, we move it over to a dev machine and do our postmortem debugging there. If you end up with a nine or 10 gig dump file, um, it's a very painful thing to do. So we've integrated proc dump. We actually did that about ooh, three or four months ago. Uh, so that if, if you run proc dump and it targets a .NET Core process, we utilize the help of .NET Core to make sure we only dump the memory that we need. And all of a sudden that tiny little ASP.NET Core Hello World app instead of having a nine or 10 gig dump file, you end up with about 130 gig, or I'm sorry, 130 megs. Um, so much, much better uh, sizing, and it makes it just so much easier to work with. In terms of installing, su super straightforward, suit up, install proc dump. Um, like I mentioned, it is open source, and this is the link on GitHub where it lives. And we do, uh, we do appreciate any type of feedback or, um, or any contributions that you want that you would like to make as well. Um, so without further ado, let's take a look at a quick demo of Procdown for Linux. The, uh, the scenario here is that we, uh, there's a process running in production. Um, it so happens that this is a .NET Core process. Um, I just wanna reiterate that you, uh, proc dump for Linux is not tied to .NET Core whatsoever. You can dump any process that you want, right? But in this particular case, we have an application that's running .NET Core, and it's a uh, ASP.NET Core web API. And what we want to do is generate a dump of that. So let's take a look at what the process might be up to right now. Um, so this is our process right now, and uh, using HTOP, we can find out the process identifier, which is going to come in useful when we um, when we run proc dump. And then it's got you know the memory columns, and it's got percent CPU used. And we can see that it kind of bounces around a little bit, anywhere from oh, I guess 45 to about 87 or 90 percent CPU. Now, as an owner of that application, I don't expect that at all. As a matter of fact, I don't expect it to go over 20 percent at its worst case, right? So what I want to do is say, hey. Get me a core dump when the CPU consumption of this process exceeds 20% using proc dump. So if I just run proc dump by itself, um, you'll notice that um, it gives you the help options. And the trigger that we're interested in in particular here is the dash capital C, which says the CPU threshold at which to create a dump of the process from. So what I'm going to run is proc dump. Oops. As a matter of fact, you got to run sudo proc dump, and we need to specify a process identifier. And in this case, the process identifier is 23545, 23545. And then we specify the dash C for the trigger on CPU. And let's just say it's, um, I guess, 20%. So running that, what you'll notice is that the first thing it says is that it, uh, it starts monitoring the process. So it's literally sitting there waiting for those for that trigger of CPU 20% to happen. And when it does, it generates a core dump. Um, and it also gives you the CPU uh, percentage that it was, was at when it generated the core. 
So here we have the core dump, and now you can take this core dump off of the machine, bring it over to uh, another box, and then debug it like you normally would. So proc dump, great in production, small footprint, and especially the, the ability to specify triggers. All right, so the next tool that we decided to take a close look at and, uh, and move over to Linux is called ProcMod for Linux. Now this is a lightweight diagnostic tool. And what it does is that it traces all the syscalls for all the processes, processes that are running on the system. So that enables you to get a really good and deep view into what all the processes are doing in terms of invoking system calls. Um, it sort of, uh, when you run ProcMont, it will list out all of the, the, the events, the syscalls, and give you further information like the duration, the amount of time the syscall took, the results of the syscalls, details includes parameters to the syscalls. Um, and even, and this is a big one, it will give you the call stack um, of the sequence of events that led up to that syscall. Now, as you can imagine, tracing all syscalls and all processes across the entire system, it results in a lot of, lot of data or a lot of events. Um, and so we've introduced some really, really nice filtering and search capabilities so that you can do deep dives into specific parts of the system, like a specific process, for example, um, and only sort of focus your attention on that. Um, installation is not yet possible. Um, we were hoping we were going to have Procmon out for preview by the time WSL Conf, conf uh, came about. Um, we're not quite there yet. We're super, super close. So um, stay tuned on, on that uh, when we do end up uh, putting it out on, on GitHub. But what I can do, I can give you a quick demo of Procmon as it stands today. So. Let's go back to our shell. Um, what we have running on this system, and this is a, a, in production, it's a component that you own and is basically a daemon that um, sits there, wakes up periodically, does a bunch of batch processing, writes the results, and then goes back to sleep, wakes up and does the same thing over and over again. Now, what you've been told is that it looks like the system is slowly and ever so slowly um, sort of quote unquote leaking file descriptors. And they feel fairly comfortable that it is as a result um, of this uh, batch processing system called batch D. And, uh, and your, your task is basically to go and figure out if that's true and, and what's happening. So I already, it's already running in the background here. And uh, what I can do is sudo ls of Rep batch D. So we've got at this moment what this command did is it basically just runs ls of, gets all the open file handles, narrows it down to batch D, which is the process that is ours, and then just does a count, which will tell us how many open descriptors there are. In this case, it's 289. And if we kind of run this a few more times, we do notice that it steadily goes up. As a matter of fact, if you just keep doing this, you'll notice the inc you know the continuous growth, and then um, it just never keeps coming down. And so the question then is, why is this happening, right? And this is an example of where we could run procmon. So let's do that. Also require sudo. Oops, procmon. Uh, I actually need to go. Am I in there somewhere? Nope. All right, so let me just go to the right place. All right, so here we go. Now, this is what happens when you run ProcBond. Uses end curses for his TUI. Um, and you'll notice that you have all the events listed here. And each event essentially corresponds to a syscall. And uh, you'll notice that it gives you a timestamp. Time um, that is relative to the start time, which is uh, shown up here. And um, it gives you the PID, it gives you the process name, the syscall itself, the result of it, 
how long it took to execute in milliseconds. Also gives you all of the um, arguments being passed to the syscall. And then furthermore, what you can do is if you actually just enter into it, it'll give you some more detailed information about that event, including the call stack. Now, as you'll notice here, um, it's saying unknown for the call stack. We're working through an issue right now in certain environments where uh, we're, we're not able to get the call stack. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, but the call stack will exist uh, when we go preview. Um, and you can see you can kind of scroll through up and down through all of the available ones. Now, in our case, we're looking at a particular process here, which is batch D. I don't particularly feel like going and, and looking for that. So you can actually just use the filter F4 and type in the process name. Uh, where, where are we? Uh, maybe I did not start. Let me try this again. Let me make sure. Um, batch D is running. So let's run proc one again. Let's just let it run for a little bit longer. Make sure that it actually leaks some of those file descriptors. And batch D, okay. So something happened in the last run, but um, here we can see now that I filtered in using F4, typed in batch D, um, we see the traces coming out of that process only. And uh, if we look at some of these traces, um, we'll see if we can start spotting some patterns. We'll notice that it calls open a couple of times. Um, and if we look sort of into the details column, it seems to be opening a file called let's see, batch D, batch dot config, presumably. Um, then it does some reads, and we see another open for batch D, batch config, another open another open and so forth. All right, so we can see that batch D appears to be opening these config files quite a bit or quite uh, quite a lot. And um, I don't see any corresponding sort of close calls for those file, file descriptors. So it is very possible that um, there is a bug in there in, in some code path that uh, simply opens the file, but it doesn't close the file descriptors, right? Um, you can, you know, sort of the next step that I would do here is look at, look at the open call, because that seems to be an interesting point, right? We're opening a file, we're not closing it. Where in the source code could that be? Well, you could grok the source code, but you could have thousands of, of, of um, open calls in there, right? Um, and that is really what the, um, the specific event details, if you hit enter on one of those, where the call stack will come in super, super helpful, right? Because that will pinpoint you the exact place in code where that open was made, and you can hone in your uh, your investigation from there. So call stack, once there, is gonna be super, super useful. All right, um, one last thing that I wanna say about Procmon um, is, uh, like, I, like I mentioned, we're tracing every single syscall for every single process on the entire system right now. One of our guiding sort of design principles was around, do we, uh, how do we make sure that our tools are lightweight so they can be used in production? Well, for Procmon and our ability to do this, it's really as a result of using a technology called BPF um, or eBPF, uh, which is a, a, a safe, way to run things in the kernel in a sandboxed environment, right? And it's super, super fast to be running in there. And that is the technology that we're using um, that has lit up 
this the super lightweightness of Procmon for Linux. All right, so the last thing I want to talk a little bit about, um, since this is kind of a lightning talk, is the future. So we're going to continue doing proc dump innovation. Uh, we're going to be adding new triggers. So instead of just having CPU and memory, there will be other triggers as well. We're going to um, we're looking into adding additional runtimes where it makes sense. Uh, like I said, we have sort of tight integration with .NET Core today. Does it make sense for us to do the same thing for Java, for Node, or any of these other runtimes? That's that's something that we're looking into. Um, for Procmon, we are racing now to get the preview out. We really would like to get it into to the community's hands, just to give um, so we understand, you know, how it's being used. Is it useful or is it not? And what can we improve? And then lastly, we will also be looking at other tools in the SysInternals tools suite that um, that we can move over to Linux as well. And so we would really appreciate if you if you have any feedback in terms of what you'd like to see, um, just let us know. You can uh, hit me up on Twitter at Mario Hewert, um, or you can go to um, our, our, uh, our repo for Procton for Linux and, uh, and, t and chat with us there, there as well. So with that, Thank you very much for your time, and uh, I hope you enjoy the WSF Conf. Thanks. Bye-bye.